But let me first uh, check. Um, just it's a Scrum day. I know. So I think the day about Scrum. So that's, that's cool. But are you actually using Scrum? Who said no? Not using Scrum. No. Sorry. It's okay to admit that, by the way. I <laughs> wouldn't be sent out or so. It's okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. Not doing Scrum. Thank you. Who say yeah? Firm. We do Scrum. Yeah. Couple hands go. Maybe, maybe the last couple of hands. Yeah. Well, we know. <laughs> might, might look like Scrum. People call it Scrum. <laughs> you, you recognize that? It's always the same. Every, every event. It's fascinating. So think about it. What can you do to turn that sort of yes, we do Scrum, but into maybe. Yes, at least we do some things, and we can do a lot more. And think so some sort of turn around that yes, but into a sort of yes, and you got system. Just sort of uh, mindset, mindset shift. Okay. So uh, anyhow, conclusion: most people in the room are doing scrum. That's cool. It's cool. It's helpful huh? on a scrum day. Now, uh, four years ago, I started writing a little book. This is a quote from my book. It's, it's a, it's, the book is called Scrum: A Pocket Guide. I don't know how how you guys are. How fluent are you in German? Over here. Are you very fluent or no? <laughs> oh, it wasn't because my book has just been published in it's been translated in German, so I, I don't know maybe German would be better than English. I don't know. It's also available in Dutch. Anybody speak Dutch? <laughs> Besides Cesare who's Dutch. No, okay. But anyhow, four years ago I expressed in my little book so this as a sort of ending quote of my book, what I truly believe in that. At some point in time, Scrum, what we now call Scrum, and, and we make it very explicit, and we think about the process, and we call out the meetings, and so on, it will just become the normal way of working. Inspecting, adapting all the way, every, every day, uh, sprint-wise, reflecting, stopping, looking back, improving, changing, adapting, whatever. And, 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 and it's, it's my sincere hope and belief still that organized organizations can and will reinvent themselves around Scrum. But I think we can boost that a little bit, because it's sort of probably the most important aspect of Scrum, all the organizational dysfunctions that, that become transparent to Scrum. It seems that we're very good in ignoring that, working around them, sort of them as well. But still, so I want to I wanna, I wanna help people uh, a little bit sort of implement upon my little personal dream. We'll see what, what happens. Now, first, um, do you remember, so almost everybody's doing Scrum. That's cool. Can it, can it take just one, two minutes? And, and talk to the people next to you, form quickly self form into teams, and talk about for one or two minutes, I'll give you a time box. By the end of the time box, I will just raise my hand, so if you see me raising my hand, please follow my example and stop talking. It's really helpful in ending a certain time box. Yeah. But anyhow, can you take one or two minutes? Let, let's take two minutes. And talk with the people, start connecting with the people next to you, and, and talk about, do you remember when, but certainly why, your organization started up in Scrum. What, what made them think that they needed Scrum? Yeah. Can you take two minutes for that? Just and talk to each other, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
sort of the secret edge of Sigma. Let's talk about it. Somebody raise his hand. So cool. Share, share a couple of points. Why, why did your organization want to do Scrum or it was who has one voice? Environments change and uh, a lot of change. Market changes. Stakeholders change their mind like all the time. Okay, okay. other things so dealing with change and, and, and complexity maybe. So the environments right? Otherwise, why? Uh, Shut creation so you uh, can resolve this and all, all things uh, help this. Yeah, so shorter cycles, working that thing we call sprints so that you can probably even launch quicker or at least get feedback faster. Yeah. It's better to fail every 30 days than every nine months. So the end. Uh -huh. Yeah, other reasons? Visibility. Just understand. Know what's going on. Yeah. Have insight into real progress and not, not sort of, do you all know that situation where like all, all, all lights are green, all projects long and then one week before you go live everybody turns red? Doesn't happen over here? Know what's going on and real progress, yeah, really important. Cool. Other, otherwise? Uh, people in teams like to work on some organized process, and Scrum is a process which is most easy to learn and adapt, comparing with some other methodologies. Right, okay. But we usually say that Scrum is simple, at least, very easy to understand. Very easy to start. Maybe not so yeah. easy to... Uh, yeah, very easy to start, but you still need to learn every, every year. Yeah. Uh, over time, companies find out that it's also in my book that Scrum is not about process; it's about behavior. You start with the process, you sort of follow the meetings, and then you start finding out that maybe a bit more, and that it's, it, it sort of boils down to behavior. Okay, cool. A, a lot of organizations seem to be wanting to do with Scrum because they want to be agile. They want to be agile too, like everybody else is going for agile. Right Maybe even executive CIO see each other at the events and, oh, we're agile. Oh, cool, I want to be agile too. <laughs> and then, oh, let's do Scrum. That seems to be very, very uh, much used name in, in this beautiful world of agile that we have. Which is fascinating because I've been working with a lot of management teams lately. And, and I always start with the question, what, what does agile mean for you? The word agile, you want to be agile, what does it mean? And it's, it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's funny and frightening to see how few people can actually answer that question? So they want something, but they have no clue. But it's, it's, it's fascinating to sort of remind people of what Agile means. And just it's in plain English, it's sort of quick, nimble, um, changing direction, changing course, just sort of very, very dynamic, dynamic way of working. And obviously, Agile in our beautiful world is that mindset that is expressed sort of through those value statements and the principles of the Agile Manifesto. But Whenever, to be honest, whenever I bring up the Agile Manifesto to explain to people, it doesn't resonate with a lot of people anymore. So I think, I think we, have a, we have a role, all of us, uh, believers of Agile and believers of the mindset of Agile, to sort of start uh, rephrasing what Agile means nowadays. But still, this is moving back to the core. So a lot of companies just want to be Agile, but whether people actually can define Agile or not, when I go into the reasons why, and it's like what you said, time to market, insights, uh, progress, knowing about reality instead of that sort of beautiful plan that never works out anyhow. So understanding reality seems to be helping a lot. Reconnecting with users and customers, reconnecting with the market, re-engaging also people. People seem to be loving Scrum because it thrives on self-organization. So re-engaging people, getting engaged workforce again, that seems to work a lot. And, and, and in a way, I sort of summarize that, and there's a lot of aspects to that, as just agility. If you're looking for agility, you want to make your company a more agile company, it's always something more like something that you are, it's like almost a color. You want to be green, it's green is not something you do, that's sort of the same for agile. But Scrum can actually help you achieve that sort of agility. Flexibility, responsiveness, being able to respond to change. Not only react to things that are happening with your market, with your stakeholders, but actually start leading again. And, and in my experience, knowing the why of your Scrum actually helps doing Scrum. Always go back, because there will be a lot of ups and downs in doing Scrum, and, and uh, suddenly a lot of problems pop up, because uh, visibility, we all think that's a beautiful thing. A lot of people don't agree with us. 
It's sort of, oh no, no, those problems, Scrum is, oh look, we're doing Scrum now, Let's see what problems we have. It's not Scrum causing those problems, it's Scrum sort of showing those problems. And we were sort of very naive, and I, I love to be a little bit naive, thinking that once we show the problems, they will be solved, people will start tackling them. It's not happening, they still swipe them under the carpet and walk around them. So we've been a little bit naive, but that's, that's, that's okay. Now just a little reminder, these are sort of the basics I, I, I get across also to management teams. I don't go in to work with CEO and teams without them understanding Scrum at least. Not turning it into Scrum classes. But Scrum, Scrum is very simple. This is how it helps you be agile. You capture all work you need to do for a product, a service or whatever into a backlog. We call it product backlog. And then you have one or multiple teams pulling work from that product backlog. And then uh, the, the ultimate way that Scrum will make you agile or give you business agility is by producing increments by the end of every sprint. Scrum says to do sprints of no more than four weeks. Nowadays it seems that everybody's sort of aligning on two weeks sprints. How long are your sprints, by the way? Two, three weeks? Or two weeks? Three weeks? One month. One month still? I remember a long time ago, I'm very old. A long time ago that we did, 2003, 2004, we did one month sprints. And that was sort of an age that was incredibly long. Nowadays that's, that's oh, 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 way too long, it has to be shorter. So the world, world is changing, the world is speeding up. Now, the only way that Scrum can help you improve, increase your business agility, that if you produce increments by the end of every sprint, regardless of how many teams that are building those increments, that you can put them on the market. Otherwise, you don't know. It's full of assumptions. You keep accumulating assumptions. And, and imagine this is something you do for your users, your consumers, the people that buy your products, that use your products, that uh, invest in your products. So you want to give uh, people a sort of customer experience. It's about your customer's journey. As long as you don't build increments that by the end of the street you can put on the market, you're not really probably increasing your business agility. Or maybe you're delivering software or probably it's faster within the company, but it's, it's about creating an impact on the market. That's, that's, that's business agility to Scrum. Now, I've, I've been doing a little check with uh, a lot of events, and, and the last one was uh, with an audience of 300 people, checking uh, almost everybody except two people were doing Scrum, so fine. Um, I was asking who is creating actually releasable versions of product by the end of a sprint and by the end of every sprint. How many people do you think out of 300 people says, oh yeah, we do that? 50%. Hmm? 50%. So 150 people out of 300? 100? 2 or 3? 10? Almost there. 5. 5 people. I don't know how the addition percentage, but still 5 people and they work from the same team. So, so we still have quite some room for improvement, you know, in people using Scrum. This is what Scrum tries to help you achieve. Be itself from a business perspective, from a market perspective. Otherwise, how can you lead? How can you blow away your competition? And that, that's sort of our sort of fun, uh, core principles of Scrum. So, but I found out that it is really, really difficult for people to achieve. It. They have to draw their imagination. Oh, how can we achieve that within our company? And I'm trying to help them. And, and what, is, what is so funny when I explain those core things of Scrum, you have a problem, you want to solve it, you bring people together, make sure that every two, three weeks you have some result that you can observe, something that's real, not just a paper, a document, a PowerPoint, whatever, so that you can inspect them and that. Oh yeah, cool, that's right. Oh, that's how we used to work a long time ago. Oh yeah, that's how that other company works, so that other company that I worked for that I used to work. Well, why don't you try to get that inside of your organization? So, but, and, and then I started thinking about what, what's this? So people recognize, see the value in those ideas. They even recognize it from earlier experience, long time ago, whatever. And so, oh, so what have we done wrong? I've been looking into that, and, and it seems that we've, a lot of companies have fallen on, for what I've, I've been calling now a growth trap. So there's just some growth. Let me try to summarize what I've, I've seen happening. So a long time ago, we had a problem. And we organized around the problem. So we made sure we had skills around it, people with skills. There was some form of leadership tackling the problem. Cool, people are successful, they need to grow, they need to sort of scale, to use a, to use a hip work. Uh, they need to scale, so uh, in general they need more skills, more people still working around the problem, still uh, organized around leadership. And then if they're really successful, it still has to grow. And for whatever reason, I don't know how we've been educating people, they, they think that they need to sort of break up, tear up that sort of working model. This is a model that worked for companies, and then, and then they tear it up. 
in, in, in a couple of ways. It's fascinating to see. And, and even companies of only like a couple of hundred people, but I think you could be really agile, they seem to be doing this. So first of all, um, things now have to organi be organized in functions, and we need executive. So we no longer need skills, whatever. No, no, we need functions, function descriptions, and we need to create silos and them. We need to sort of tear them apart. And, and in order to make it make it work, we need executives for that. But you know what? It has to be it has to be even worse than that. We can't have business and IT work together, right? They have to be separated. So it's not only tearing up skills into functions, but we have to separate it. So some sort of business IT and a big gap in between, and then uh, the sort of the enemy. Oh, they're working for the same company. Funny. And we need additional executives then in, in each side of the of the company. Very, very fascinating. We find out, oh, it doesn't really work. No problem. We have governance for that. We have governance to make well, handovers, meetings, uh, processes, procedures, whatever. Things that need to happen. And suddenly, what are we doing? It's, it's, it's funny. And, and even nowadays, I work with companies of 150 people. They're on the edge of, we need to grow. Because they, for very valid reasons, they're successful, things are going well for them, they need to grow. And, and it feels that people think that then have to reorganize into like functions and functional silos, which is very strange instead of sort of growing the model that they have. And, and the end result of this is everybody turns big, and everything turns big, also systems, backends, but also structures, departments, and you end up in a situation, do not touch that, please stay away from it. Not, not you hear that sort of back-end system. I don't know who's working in the financial sector, but they're really good at having really huge, massive back-end systems. Don't touch that system. Whatever you do, don't touch it. Stay away from it. It's like the Medusa. Once, oh, you don't want to look at it. It's so dirty. It's so nasty. You might turn into stone. So sort of run away from it. It's not really helping. You, you, you have to touch it at some point in time. Last, last year, I was in Denmark working with a, a big Scandinavian bank. And they're trying to rewrite a complete core banking system. It's a huge bank. And, and they're going to do it agile. But you know what? By the end, they're going to do it in a big bank release. Instead of slicing up things and so on. So maybe it's not going to be really successful. I don't know. But it's, it's sort of the, it's the result of how you organize. It's sort of big bank. Everything is big, huge. You can't touch anything without. So it's sort of the, the spaghetti effect. So, but you can't run away from Medusa. You're going to have to face it at some point in time. Otherwise, you'll probably be that anyhow in, in a short while. So, and, and, and that's funny. So, that's sort of funny. So, that's how you've grown. Okay, well, let's look at the future. So, uh, a couple of, uh, 10 years ago, sprints of four weeks, very acceptable, even very short. Felt like, oh, this is really fast. It's not nearly fast enough nowadays. It has to be two weeks. So, the world is speeding up. So, how are you as a company, having fallen for the growth gap, how are you going to deal with the future? And the future is that that's nasty thing, it's scary, it's like, oh, you wake up in the morning, oh no, it's again, it's tomorrow again, oh no, not me, I'm scared of the future. So, how, what's your plan to deal with it? I've, been, I've tried to create a couple of, uh, it's archetypes, I know it's simplification, not really helpful, but still. I've, I've, I've encountered a number of companies that are just, oh, we don't care, we're the big fat emperor, we're big, we're, we're huge, we've got plenty of money, we've got success, we are economically viable, we, we don't care about all these things. Anybody working for a company like that? No? Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. So this week I was in, in Munich, in Germany. There were a lot of people from BMW in the room. And they were like, laughing, yo, oh, that's so, that's so silly. <laughs> Big fat ever. we don't care. Why don't we go for it all? Nobody can touch us. Nobody can hurt us. We're, we're market dominators. Now, long time ago, by the way, Microsoft followed from themselves too. And then there was a little sort of smallish sort of agile player called Google. Look, look what happened. Microsoft at least a couple of decades to get over it. So maybe being big fat emperor. And now there's also companies ignoring that agile thing. We don't need it. Yeah. And, and, but it might be something. Do you know anybody ever, ever cut himself on a paper? That can be really nasty, right? Now one paper cut won't hurt you that much. You can put a patch over it and that's okay. But you know what, if you're working in an organization, and on your market, there's a lot of maybe new, even unknown players nowadays. So let's call them the Airbnb of your market. Or in, in Carter, maybe the Tesla of your market. New players, uh, innovative, highly tech companies driven. Now, they're going to hurt you not just in one place, but in several places. And I know some companies say, they can't hurt us. They're sort of bleeding all over the place. We know it's all little paper cuts. 
But you can die on a thousand paper cuts. And, and what if you can try to ignore it? You can be a big fat emperor and still die with a thousand paper cuts, by the way. If you don't start acting now. Well, that's, that's cool. That's funny, BMW, they, they are finding out that they need to act. Uh, the Scandinavian bank, they still think they have plenty of time. They will find out. Uh, and now, uh, there's, there's companies that are sort of uh, mid-sized, medium-sized, smallish, but in a way nothing that distinguishes them, which is fascinating. If you work for a company for like 100, 200, 300, 500 people, you've got everything to, to be really agile. I don't know about your market over here, but do you know Prince2? That sort of governance type of framework? And they're over flooded with procedures and like, you're 200 people, why do you have all that cracking in place? And then, uh, you know what, you've got nothing that distinguishes you. At some point in time, you will just be serving as a breakfast for some big fat emperor. You will just be eaten if you don't start being a bit more agile now. And, and the last one is sort of the favorite plan for organizations to sort of survive the future and that's sort of to eat themselves. In an ongoing story of restructuring, reorganizations, yeah, we need to get rid of the bad people, so we're going to reorganize, have less functional silos, but still silos, and then and, and, uh, talk restructuring, firing people, laying off people, and so on. And then suddenly, so oh, very fascinating. We wanted to get rid of the bad people, and now the good people go through. That's because it's not a positive story, it's not something that resonates with people, it's not something that helps. And that's sort of a whole story. So that's what I try to bring with so diversify with those organizations. What if you sort of not just plan? What if you just act for a positive, a positive future? What if you would give your people a positive view, thinking about reorganizing the way you work, not just reorganizing in terms of structure, but a bit more structurally, and then uh, start working towards results again? And people might leave. Other people will just uh, shift shapes and find a different uh, role within the organization. But I truly believe that there is a way forward. Regardless of the size of a company, everybody can change, update, uh, and, and, and adapt, adapt themselves to the new market. It's reverse right. It's a strange word, it's an old English words, I believe. This is the official, the official thing. It's more like bringing rhythm, almost like sort of uh, bringing that sort of old poetry back into the organization. Be a bit, a bit prosaic about it. Yeah? So finding out the new organization, it's about simplicity. Um, it's about for those companies that I, I visit nowadays and they're sort of, they are really grasping for simplicity. They're, they're sort of, it's what I called sort of the second scrum wave recently. Uh, so I, I identified something that I would call a first, a, a first scrum wave, sort of between 2005, 2006 until 2010, 2011, when in a way Agile, this old Agile way of working across the chasm. Does that resonate with you guys, the chasm? A few more things. Well, to summarize it, uh, Agile became sort of accepted. People wanted to be Agile, so it was sort of uh, becoming mainstream almost. And then people were discovering Scrum. Scrum became sort of the market leader in, inside of the Agile space. And then as from 2010, 2011, I know how that was over here in Ukraine, but suddenly a lot of big companies started discovering Agile and Scrum. And they all wanted to be Agile, like <coughs> tomorrow or next week. And, and then it was like, oh, first Scrum, and then, oh, DevOps, and then Save, and lots of other movements. It, it went sort of all over the place, uh, sort of a divergent. But you know what? Once you looked underneath all those fancy, fancy names that people were using, still were, people were actually still trying to just do Scrum, have releasable software, releasable versions of product available uh, regularly, frequently at least. And, and I feel like now, Last year I saw some sort of new interest in Scrum, the simplicity of Scrum, all those beautiful, big, complicated, very complex things. People are finding out that it's maybe not really helping them. They thought it was going to help them, it took them a couple of years to find out. So I see people wanting to sort of converge again. That's why I'm allowed in again, just saying, I'm Scrum. okay, Scrum is a, is a good word again. So in the past I couldn't say that, or I still do. So, um, and that's why I say, so using your imagination to rethink, reimagine how you do Scrum, and then starting with that to reversify or reimagine your organization. That's sort of what I'm trying to present to people. And, and it's based on a common, some common challenges that people seem to have in with Scrum. So the goal of Scrum is to have uh, one, several teams build a product or a service. Now, uh, difficulty number one is identifying what is a product in our company. And a product can be a service, an application, a website, a mobile application. But even that seems to be very difficult for organizations. 
because we have reused systems and reused infrastructure and services, it's all mingled and entangled. Very difficult to that was not me. <laughs> very difficult to identify even what, what is a product for us. And you know what? To keep it simple, start with sort of identifying a product as at least one sort of software, a system, an application, a website, whatever. And then a uh, second problem is once you've identified the product, oh, how about we go to ever create one backlog for that product? Because it's a product backlog, it's a backlog for the product. Or oh, we now work with team backlogs or the department backlog. It's not the goal of Scrum. The goal of Scrum was to create a product backlog, a backlog for your product. And then have one, several teams working for that. And even more difficult, not having one product backlog only, but also having an owner of a product who's also from the business side of things. Because Scrum doesn't care about business IT. Scrum cares about having the right person with the right insights and mandates and, and, and knowledge to set priorities over what needs to be developed first. That's very difficult. So we have that question mark. Where does that product owner come from? And question to those management teams. So everybody's looking at the CIO or the, the IT manager. They all think that agile, that's all, that's an IT problem, right? And then there's a strange guy coming and saying, okay, so who's setting priorities? Well, IT does that. Ooh, bad. Why are you allowing that? Ooh, dangerous. Why would you allow IT to set your priorities? It should be business driven. It should be about value, market, impact on your market. And uh, oh, everybody's waking up. Oh, so agile is not just an IT problem. Business agility is a company problem. Well, that's, that's fascinating. And then maybe sort of the development or the IT side of things. How can you create a context and environment in which teams can actually build releasable versions of product by the end of every two, three weeks? And not just a version of product that can go to the QA or the testing department. No, no, no. Actually releasable, something you could put on the market in production. So, just a couple of challenges, and then there's a fourth one. Just, well, business should not only deliver, let's say, the product on it, they should also be involved in the development process. In a way, be part of what we call in Scrum development teams. Development is not just coding, it's not just testing, it's a lot of things. It's doing all the work needed to create reusable versions of product. So, you need business people involved in that. Oh, business, we don't have time for that. Hmm. If you're thriving on software and systems and, and, and products, and if those products are critical, what can be more important than being involved in that process? Producing paperwork or attending meetings? Well, maybe. So, very common challenges with Scrum. So, Scrum is a great tool to give you business agility. It's very easy to understand. Maybe not so easy to implement because these are common challenges. And, and the way I try to help organizations actually literally bring out this advice. Whether you're, you are doing Scrum or not, it makes no difference. Select one project, one product, one initiative, whatever in general terms, that might be a service. Product is, is starting to be a sort of outdated term. Do you feel that too? People say, oh, we don't have product. Yeah, well, I'll call it a service. Just a generic name. Select one initiative, one, and in a way, reimagine how you do Scrum on that initiative. Meaning, make sure you have a product owner from the business. Make sure you have one product backlog and let that one product backlog be your plan for your product. All the work that's involved. Instead of all the time having to consolidate like five, six backlogs that are out there and you've no idea. Again, visibility, transparency. Know what's going on? It starts by having one product backlog. You need an owner from the business. Please reset your accountabilities. Stop thinking in terms of all those sub roles and sub skills, whatever. And rethink your accountabilities and please go for the accountabilities of Scrum. They're pretty, pretty powerful. And then make sure that you facilitate people, make sure that they have tools that they have access to infrastructure, reset in a way your, your deployment pipeline so that your teams have access to the full deployment pipeline, authorizations and so on. Um, oh, we can't allow that, that's not allowed by risk. Well, you know what, the best risk mitigation strategy that Scrum offers you is making sure that you have a version of product that you can inspect every two weeks. There is no more powerful risk mitigation than that. But yeah, it does include some trust in people. Oh no, trust, risk, oh, can't go together. Right? So, and then make sure that you have for that one initiative the ability by doing these little steps to create releasable versions of product, release candidates every two, three, four weeks. And that's, whoa, that's beyond our imagination. Oh well, yeah, then don't do it. And get eaten or a die from a thousand paper cuts. Why not? But you know what? Select one initiative. Do this first. Do this for a number of sprints. Ingrain the learnings. Learn. Um, feel how it works for you guys. And then, and then start growing again. And how you can start growing again. And this is sort of the idea. This is how this evolved. 
Has anybody ever heard about the idea of a Scrum Studio? Not many people. You see how successful we are in creating new ideas and getting them out. Nobody knows. Um, has anybody ever heard? It's just a little, little side. Everybody heard about the idea of agility path? Same person. Uh, is part of our, our uh, <laughs> ecosystem. So again, beautiful of ourselves to, to think about an agile transformation framework based on the principles and the ideas of Scrum, and then just not being able to explain it to people so nobody gets it. Okay. So the idea of a Scrum Studio is to create some sort of bounded environment within your organization within which you're doing Scrum. You're doing Scrum properly. A Scrum Studio is something that you grow. It's not something you implement. It's not a fixed structure. Something you grow by selecting one initiative, do Scrum on that initiative, and then grow by selecting more initiatives and do Scrum, expand gradually, product after product after product. You can try to skip that sort of iterative incremental growth and it will not help. That's why this is also very relevant for all organizations I visit. Yeah, we do Scrum. Cool. Are you producing releasable increments of software by the end of every sprint? Oh yeah, five out of 300 teams. Sort of that idea. Okay, so maybe there's room for improvement. So you think you're doing Scrum? Cool, great start. Let's do it better. Let's improve. Select one initiative, do these additional steps. You're not doing Scrum? Fine. This is a great way to get started. This, this always comes back to iterative incremental growth. Change comes in increments too. You can't just impose suddenly change. And that is just one, one growth, uh, one way to grow uh, your Scrum within your organization. And, and I hope you will notice that um, this will be sort of the prevalent way of working. Your daily work is done as part of teams working for products. It's no longer being part of a department. You're still part of a department. That's fine. You don't have to skip that, although you could. But your daily work is happening for a product that's being built for customers, users, consumers, and so on. And you're working with one several teams together. So there's a sort of second dimension, second organizational dimension we create. But then the real challenge is to sort of expand the definition of what a product is. So for whatever strange reason, I, I get to see a lot of financial institutions been working with uh, some insurance companies lately. So I'm going to use an example of, of an insurance company. So don't only use Scrum to uh, maintain, evolve, uh, grow a website or a system or an application. No, do it to uh, maintain and create a insurance product, a car insurance, a fire insurance, housing insurance, whatever. It's really an end user product, something that your consumers see. So that means that suddenly your ecosystem built around the product needs additional skills. Skills from the business side of things, from that sort of, let's, let's call them the green areas of things. So, and, and bring those people together, make sure they are connected to what's have, ever happening in, in delivery. Um, do, do, do you all have the problem over here in Ukraine or uh, circumventing uh, adjacent countries that sometimes uh, marketing salespeople, they promise a release by a certain date Having no clue whether that's actually possible or not, you know, they get incentivized on it and then just, here, product owner, make it happen. You don't have, you don't have, right. That's sort of what we're trying to solve by making sure that those people get connected. So, and, and in a way to grow that, that second, that second uh, line of thinking, there's sort of two possible scenarios that I, that I see for people. First of all, everything in Scrum revolves around the product. There's a number of activities that need to be organized for a product. Um, the financial aspect, product strategy, product road mapping, sales, marketing, communication, I don't know, pricing strategies, lots of fascinating things. But the product probably also needs to be built and be delivered. Now, at the first step, you certainly need a product owner at the heart of the product. Yeah? And uh, you could use Scrum just for the delivery aspects of, of, of your product. That means in another way of representing it, it means that um, in order to start connecting all those general product management activities to product delivery again, it all goes through the product owner. Right? Product owner owns the product, um, is, is, is at the heart of the product, and make sure that all those product management, sales, marketing, whatever activities um, are connected to delivery or development via that product owner. And also the other way around, that via the product owner, updates on actual progress and actual possibilities are being communicated to those people. So what on the, on the product management side of things, if, I don't know, stupid things like trainings need to be organized, that at least it's in, in sync with the actual development and not some sort of theoretical plan. But I feel that's not ambitious enough, plus it puts a lot of, <laughs> a lot of strain on that little poor product owner having to do all that work. 
it's a lot of work. Having business involvement in development teams certainly helps, by the way. But I think we should be more ambitious and we should be able to not only have a product owner at the heart of the product, but let that product owner actually be what I call the product CEO. We used to call it mini CEO, product CEO. The CEO, not of the company, but at least of the product. And then include all those activities in your ecosystem called Scrum. That's the second scenario. Meaning, in other way, you have a product owner, but you're not only doing product delivery through Scrum, but you can organize all those product management activities, sales, marketing, finance involvement, whatever. You can also include that in your ecosystem of Scrum. So that, in a way, alignment and synchronization is not just done to that one poor little person called product owner, but it's done via sprints. One product backlog, having all that work, capturing that work, and organizing that work. Um, all product management activities that are related to a product. Maybe there's still other sales marketing work that needs to be done outside of products. That's fine to do that in your organization. You could even do Scrum for that, although it's not necessary, it's not mandatory. But if you're doing sales marketing work for a certain product, it should be part of your uh, Scrum ecosystem. And that's sort of, ooh, this sort of, this requires a lot of imagination of people. So the key word is for me imagination and, and, and try to reimagine Scrum. And then certainly when You've set up like you've grown in products. You have one product, several products. You start expanding the idea of a product, merging that sort of uh, product lines together towards uh, consumer products or end customer products. And then, oh, yeah, how, do, how do we deal with portfolio and program management and so on? Because it has to be organized in a really heavy way, right? No, no, it doesn't. It, it, it's, it's a natural thing in, in Scrum, I think, for a product owner. If you're the product CEO and you're managing your product, how do you align products? towards each other, find the product owners, right? Aligning product backlogs on each other. And, and hopefully uh, product owners will work together in thinking how much value did every product already deliver for how much budget, maybe, maybe in 2017, what's the projection of the forecast of value to be delivered for the product? And as product owners work together in shifting budgets and, and, and shifting focus, maybe even, even uh, rethinking goals and, and strategic directions. So you've created, but the core idea is to create an ecosystem around a product to service, expand the, the ID or the definition of, of your product, and then have product owners aligned. It's a much more simple organization. It's again, simplicity of Scrum, easy, simple, not easy, but it really works well. And you can, you can, you can get in a system of more continuity. So you'll get a number of product hubs. And this is back to the old working model. When people work around skills, people, teams organize around a problem. In our case, Scrum, a problem is a product that needs to be developed, created, evolved, maintained, and so on. So you create an ecosystem around a product, and you make sure that uh, product hubs work together. And what sort of glues them together is leadership. Is it management? Is it executive leadership? Might be, why not? Not saying that this has to be a totally flat structure, there has to be some sort of drive direction for the company, strategic visions and so on. But it doesn't mean that everything is imposed on people. So you sort of re-engage people. This is sort of, and this, this would have been a uh, avoidance of the growth trap. Instead of splitting up a working system into skills and, and executive and trying to make it work together with uh, governance. Now this is for existing organizations, again, very, very difficult to imagine. They see the value of the ideas. Very difficult to implement. Yeah? So this is also looking far away in future, way too far away in future, to be really honest. I don't feel comfortable doing this. Just start with one project, one service, do Scrum. In a way, do it properly, learn, invest, and grow your own model. So that's sort of, sort of the, the idea. This is sort of how, uh, uh, sort of a couple of shifts that I want, quickly want to share. Um, in order to make something like this happen, what we did in the past is, yeah, overtime and work harder and, whoa, you're not in time. Okay, let's make, let's make the deadlines even more hard. Yeah, that's really helpful. But what if you would try to re-engage your people, invest in your people, invest in skills, in trainings, make sure that there's the right infrastructure in place. And, and as management, what if you would step in actually to actually help Scrum Masters remove impediments? Now, that's a fascinating managing role. What for uh, executives? Elimination of low value. The, the most underrated aspect of an agile way of working. Maximizing the work not done. Stop doing 30 projects when you only have like five teams in place. 
Nobody can handle all that work. You just totally lo lose focus. Yeah, but you know, we're going to make we're going to make some unhappy people. Yeah, well, focus or what do you want? So and then within your products, eliminate those things that you think you might be building someday. So really, really, very, very radical focus again. Stop doing all those projects. Do the ones that are really core to your to your company. And even in those projects, eliminate what uh, you want, don't want to do. And in order to manage all these systems, um, add a feedback loop. So you have Scrum, everybody knows Scrum, two feedback loops, Sprint is a feedback loop, and then within the Sprint you have uh, the daily Scrum at least. On top of that, you have uh, lots of additional feedback loops if you do your, uh, your development properly by testing and whatever you want to do, whatever practices. Um, maybe you want to manage a little bit on top of that. You want to do Scrum to become more agile or increase your business agility. Start thinking about measuring that so that you have a point of inspection, so that you can adapt upon it. You want to measure, in a way, your agility, so you can sort of help your organization change by facilitating change in your organization, making sure people have the skills, that they get trained, that they can work together, that it's not just cross-functional teams, but they're actually cross-fertilizing each other, learning from each other, improving together as a team, as, as a whole. So that's sort of a great role for, I don't know whether it's executive leadership management, I, I, I sort of hate that sort of distinction. Yeah, it has to be a lead and not a manager. What if they would just be connected or one and the same? How can you be a manager without being a leader? How can you be a leader without managing anything? That, that sort of duality that we love to create. Fascinating, but not helpful. So what if things were just entangled? So measure your agility so that you can facilitate change, support change, support teams, remove impediments, and so on. And last thing I want to bring up, some possible key agility areas. Um, not a test, so nobody knows what. Do you know about, you don't know about agility path? Has anybody ever heard about what once upon a time we called evidence-based management? Or EBM GT by Scrum Control? See, oh, it's already two people. That's, that's, we've just doubled our, uh, our, uh, <laughs> our presence. So uh, we, we've been thinking about helping companies manage this way of doing Scrum and manage sort of the, the, the transformation that you go through via Scrum and uh, I've been renaming stuff a lot. Um, what if you would start sort of measuring your, uh, the value that you're creating with your software in terms of monetary uh, aspects, probably financial returns, but also employee engagement, how engaged are your employees? It's fine to make a lot of money if your employees are leaving all the time, it's not helpful probably. And certainly some aspect of customer satisfaction. It's just a sample idea of things that you might want to measure. What if you would measure how adaptable you are? What's your release frequency? How much time does it take you to put an increment into production? Sort of those, those things. Uh, what's your typical cycle lead time? Just to give yourself an indication of how agile are we actually? How responsive? Because these are the things that will make you responsive. Right? And how, how, how able are you to sort of innovate? Um, how much dead code do you have? How much unused features do you have in, in your code bases? Yeah. Um, how much new products have you created the past four, four or five years? Or have you just been tweaking, slightly enhancing existing products? That's probably not too mind-blowing for your customers, right? So how, how well are you at innovating? Because I think Scrum done well and, and in an agile way. It's not just about producing value, making sure that you have a high level of uh, adaptiveness, but also innovate, start things uh, again. Unless you want to end up like sort of the new Nokia or, or the new Kodak long time ago when digital photography uh, came onto the world. Just some sample ideas. Hey, so that things you can measure, these are sort of indicators that you want to capture so that you know, oh, we are not improving in a certain way. We are, we are not improving, enhancing, increasing our agility. What can we do? What, how can we help the teams to do even better? instead of bashing on the teams and overtime and work and so on. Yep. So, and then uh, this describes a pretty huge shift in, uh, in management. Whenever I present this slide to uh, executive teams, obviously everybody wants to be on the green side. That's very beautiful, but what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it yourself as management? That's, that's, that's very difficult. And these are some things that people might want to do. Yeah. So, Long story, this is Reversify. It's based upon um, my idea of agility. And this is, again, this is a quote from my book four years ago. When I said, well, you know, this idea of agility, business agility, 
it's not something you can plan. It's not planable. It's not the idea. I, I, I know some companies say, oh yeah, we want to be 100% agile by the end of the year. Cool. First of all, define agile. Define what would be 100% agile. And how on earth would you be able to know that you will be 100% agile by the end of the year? That's sort of, maybe you're not totally getting the mindset of agile. Yeah. So agile can't be planned. It can't be dictated without yourselves embracing Scrum, going for Scrum, going through the hard work that Scrum requires, nothing's going to happen. And, and no, no five management layers telling you that you have to do Scrum without involving you, without getting you excited about it, will ever work. And agility never stops. It's about continuous adaptation. There is no end state to agility. That's the essence of agility. And unfortunately, this was four years ago, I, I, uh, over the past couple of years, I did have to add this one. It's in red, you can't see it. It can't be copied. There is no cookbook recipe that will make you agile. And, and, and there's companies out there, a lot of them, that think that they can copy agile. Oh, another company has done it like that. Let's copy what they have done, implement it over here. At best, you get some sort of cargo cult implementation, uh, certainly of Spotify, not, not wanting to name the term, but you can't just copy that thing without the underlying growth process, the learning processes, and so on. So core messages, grow your own model. Baseline those principles, the product focus, the cross-functional team, self-organizing system, product apps, and so on. Let that be your future. It's a positive future, and it will help you grow your own model. You can struggle for three years trying to implement, say, Spotify, whatever you see on the market, and then find out, damn, it's not really working. And then you just wasted a lot of money, effort, and also engagement of people. What if you would have used the same time to just grow your own model? Things take time. You can't rush this. So, core message is reversify. Do it step by step. Change comes in increments. Grow your own model. Okay, have a great day. Thank you for being here.